I'm Power Rack now. <laughs> no, I know. I've got Power Rack. <laughs> power Rack, I think you've got Power, power rack. rack. Yeah, got Power Rack. <laughs> In my head, this was really clever. Yeah, <laughs> it still looks cool. Though. Ninety percent of the game is just to make it look cool. Oh, to be fair, actually, it's a really cool meal. Well. And I feel like I went overboard. Oh, say hi. Hi. Fuck, this is fluid. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do questions that obviously other people have given us. I've written them all down. <laughs> but we want to make it a little bit more interesting and we're going to eat a shitload of food at the same time. Um, but this is going to be the first video for Barber Resistance and we're going to cover questions on powerlifting and we'll come back I'm sure. I will. Um, on powerlifting, on nutrition, on competition, uh, training as a whole. Um, and at the same time we want to represent daily calories, so the hardest thing to explain to people is the basics of calories. Everyone likes these fad diets or they like trends. Um, so we're trying to represent a bit of all of that and kind of show how it doesn't actually matter. Um, basic principles apply to everything. Getting, so. getting the basics right first before yeah. anything else. Like I think people worry way too much about everything. the intricate details of dieting, um, nutrition, training as well. We'll cover a little bit of training. Um, and the point of this, even though it looks absolutely ridiculous, it's fucking awesome, <laughs> is that the fact is that we're still actually hitting uh, our calories, getting fairly close to our macros as well. Probably not. <laughs> Mostly, not ideal. Um, so I'll have Aaron's calories over his face and I'll put my calories over. Um, we should be pretty much the same today, um, except I've got a lot more broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll go through. So we basically, in principle, we have these, uh, and not calling anyone out, but completely calling people out. We have a bro meal of your chicken, broccoli, rice. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Nothing nothing <laughs> wrong with any of these. Just, <laughs> so yeah, bro meal, and then you have your, what people call a cheat meal, so we have a full Domino's each, and then we have a, like the Weight Watchers meals, a healthy living meal from Tesco, yeah, which is Tesco, low calorie. Oh, we've both got an Atkins bar, and haven't you got something else? Yeah, because I'm on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> oh yeah, I've got a protein cookie as well. And yeah. protein oh, shakes. we both have protein shakes, yeah. This is all we're eating today, so the sacrifice is fucking real. We're only eating this much food for you. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, but we have been sent some uh, questions that we'll answer while we're doing it. But, yeah. Yeah, we need to remember to actually do the questions, because that was the point of this. Yeah, but I'm, like, I'm going to eat for a bit, so yeah. I'm to answer. I really want to eat. Okay, eat well, I'll fast forward the next bit. <laughs> if every time you answer a question, just pick up the paper, so that when I'm editing... Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's a good shout. I'd love if your anyway. face was in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the first question of the day um, was Alex, actually, and he put, does unused protein get converted into fat? What he basically said is, like, there's not, there's not been, like, a ton of research that I've seen on it anyway, in the specifics, because I don't think it's something that's ever really going to come around. Um, I think it's really unlikely that you are going to overeat on protein. Um, it's pretty easy in the course of a day to eat three, four, five, six hundred grams of carbs or even fat. But to do that with protein is going to be really, really difficult. So I don't think it's going to apply to a lot of people anyway. Um, the other aspect of it is also thermogenesis as well. Um, protein and fiber um, basically uses a lot more energy uh, to digest, which basically means you're going to be burning more calories eating protein as opposed to carbs and fats. It's not a lot more. Um, but obviously there is that minor detail in there as well. Um, so I think, so if you look you look at this at two different perspectives, so the basic version, if you overeat anything, you're gaining weight if it's over what your um, maintenance was. So if you're eating more protein than um, you would have taken in as your total calories, then you yeah, there'll be a change in body weight. But um, when it comes down to the specifics of your macros, excessive amounts of calories, uh, the nuanced answer is going to go into Exactly as Aaron says, so uh, the rate of digestion for protein is slightly different. The um, required effort of the body, to put it in simple terms, um, to break down protein is a little bit more, so there's more energy expenditure. So it doesn't quite digest as simply as uh, some people know one gram of protein is four calories. And it's a little bit different. There's quite a lot of diets actually that do do that. They sort of like give you food choices that are very, very difficult to overeat on. Um, just tell somebody why to only eat protein. Try yeah, yeah. Protein. If you're only going to eat protein, or you're only going to eat really like fiber dense carbs, and the chances are you're probably not going to overeat. Did you that enough for that question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so to clarify exactly how much we've got, so so at the moment what we're eating, I've got 400 grams of chicken, 250 grams of rice, and 400 grams of broccoli. Um, 
So one thing we want to cover, this as a whole, the basic uh, principle still stands. So your intake over a day, your intake over a week um, is what's going to determine your uh, body composition. There's two other things to kind of cover here. Um, is it optimal? So if you take someone who's prepping for a powerlifting competition or someone who's prepping for a bodybuilding show or a run, or, they want to be more specific. So there is finer details, but this is the very basic stage. Get your calories right, then get your macros right, then your micros. Yeah, exactly. Like If you're like a top level athlete, there's obviously other things to consider, but for the majority of people, you're, you're probably not. So get the basics right first, get consistent with that, then worry about anything else. Like don't worry about even like supplements, you know, other stuff like that. I mean, other than obviously the basics for like whey protein, maybe creatine. We'll cover those but, as well. Yeah, so I guess if you do this for a long amount of time first, you're gonna get way further than you ever would of if you just keep chopping and changing and thinking about the, the finer details. <laughs> we should also say like, we haven't, well, I've done a bit of YouTube before I filmed the camera one on one, but it's the first time we've done a Q&A with two people all could be sitting in a room eating food. So. And this is the first time in my life ever that I've done anything like this, bro. I've never spoken to a camera in my life. It's like he's got a channel. This is probably a lot you're going to see this through Facebook. Um, we'll link it on Instagram. So on Instagram, Barber Resistance, at Barber Resistance, you can find us. And then YouTube, I don't even know what the channel is because you made it. Barber Resistance. Yeah, it's hard to remember. <laughs> <laughs> then, if you don't know who we are by now, then fuck it. Do we have to go through that as well? Five minutes. Ah. <laughs> the obviously, my name's Aaron. Um, half of the sort of Barber Resistance company that we're trying to get going at the moment. Um, I basically enjoy lifting, I enjoy learning about nutrition and training. Um, my passion is probably actually playing football, um, I like sports, um, but I have sort of also gone into the lifting side of things as part of my own training and um, pretty much it. Like the fact you're not mentioning a great deal of clients with a great deal of success and a successful career. Oh, I have a job as well. Yeah, I do stuff sometimes <laughs> on his behalf. Uh, does one-on-one -on -one sessions out of right with clients that he takes on full time. Has uh, for various goals so people who are into weight loss, into strength gain, or both. Um, which is something we'll cover. But anyone who thinks that those are uh, independent of one another is complete bullshit. Um, they could all work and integrate, but still. Uh, and then on top of the clients. Uh, runs oh, nice. barbell uh, resistance where we are going to and are currently peaking people for competitions, taking people to powerlifting competitions and like, um, and on that same level I do that with him. Um, I myself am Callum, you are the, um, I am definitely myself. Sorry. <laughs> That's the end of that. No, we're good. Oh, this, I'm going to have such a bad day today. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't move. New introduction. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh, a powerlifter um, in the BDFPA or the WDF. Where the fuck is WDFPA? I'll check that another time. Um, <coughs> I lift heavy things. Uh, so, uh, two different sides. So, I have a master's in sports rehabilitation, so I work in the rehab side of things with athletes. So, if you're injured, trying to get you back onto the field, a very simple premises. Um, and then I compete in powerlifting, have done for about three years, gym for about five years. Uh, I'm the current world champion in WDF. What the fuck is it? I'm current world champion in my federation. Um, 75 kilo class, and I have British records as a junior, and so on. So I'm more experienced in the actual strength side of things than I am anything else. Um, I've been through the fat loss, uh, and then I went from being severely underweight to back where I am now, where I can't eat broccoli. Um, so yeah, uh, a relative, just me and Aaron come from very, very different standpoints because we're, we're actually the benefit from our resistance. I was solely strength based, I didn't have an interest in sport ever, whereas Aaron came into the strength work because of his sport based. Um, and this is what I'm saying from before, they overlap massively. But you would have gone to the pizza room and I'd almost finished a broccoli. Alright, it's <laughs> off the side down, off the side down. It's because I'm drinking that as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's of me, I think that's it. Um, oh, and I have full-time clients as well who I coach for various reasons, most of them are women. Um, I don't know why. I feel like that's a standpoint. <laughs> no, because I've realised that most people, so that's one topic I want to cover is, but we're going to talk about strength training, mm. and people are going to think this is for men. And I want to, oh, no, at no. some point I'll get into that topic, but not right now, because right Because you've got a lot of broccoli in between. I'm going to try and make it relatively easy. I'm going to go throw this entire stalk away. This doesn't count towards my calories. <laughs> Try oh, you picked up the original. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> was, um, I don't know if I should say who's 
asking it because they might not want me to, so I'm just going to go through this one. We'll leave the names from now. Yeah. Um, a little bit. Nice. <laughs> Fast forward that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not going to do it. Definitely won't. Um, is uh, a strength based program, like a weight strength based program, enough for cardiovascular fitness in itself? Or would you incorporate some high intensity uh, cardio or um, like steady state, just running? Um, Person who asked this question also feels like if they, which I thought was actually more interesting than the start of the question, that they um, get domed quite badly, which prevents them from doing the cardio in the first place. Okay. Which I'd probably address that first and say like um, you might want to look at your programming in general if you've got doms all the time. Like it's, I think a lot of people do train like that. Like I used to train like that. You don't coach this to do. <laughs> What's that? You don't coach this <laughs> <person. Yeah. laughs> all the time. Um, but no, like realistically, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't ache that badly all the time. Um, if you're suffering from muscle soreness, it's normally due to a rapid increase in volume or intensity. Um, and if you're training like that all the time, it's probably not. <laughs> you don't want to get into that whole situation of like overtraining and stuff like that. Because it's not overtraining; it's just building up the work capacity to be able to deal with the amount you're doing. Um, and generally, if you're aching all the time, it might not even be a case of doing too much. It might just be pushing it too much on one set. But you shouldn't be sore all the time. Um, you need to probably look at the uh, your actual program as a whole and find a, a maybe a more gentle way to progress it. And then you should be able to include other things like like you're running, like your high intensity training and actually get away with doing it. It tends to be actually as well, like if you increase like your frequency or if you, even sometimes I think if you just do it, if you just like include cardio, um, your work capacity sort of builds to that anyway. And then if you if you just sort of go ahead and do it, um, two or three weeks down the line, you probably wouldn't be aching as much sort of thing. But my, my suggestion would be if you've got DOMS all the time, maybe maybe cut back a little bit on what you're doing and sort of build up your, your work capacity until you can actually do that without aching all the time because there's, there's times when you should ache like if, if you've had like a really intense session or you've you know up the volume of it that you're going to get occasional sessions where you suffer from doms but you shouldn't be you shouldn't be having them all the time um but the actual question itself sorry mate, I'll go a few oh, i was just going to join to that yeah. quickly but um talking about the, the concept of overtraining which is covered in better detail so by some different sources of literature. Um, even Chad Wesley Smith has some writings on it. Um, but if, if you want to go to a simpler concept, if what you're doing in one session is ruining several other sessions and those sessions are ruining sessions, you're actually going downhill, you are overtraining um, because you're under recovering, you're yeah, creating exactly, too yeah. much workload, so you can't sustain. Um, so people who are getting problems quite regularly, and it's the, this, uh, often it's not just people who have got slightly uh, odd thing in their programming is people who are doing those sessions where you intentionally destroy a muscle group. Yeah, like you go into hammer it. And then you can train, like they do squats, they do uh, the 10 by 10 every week and then their legs are raised and they can't squat for another week. Your progression is completely limited. Um, yeah, because effectively you could probably get that same amount of working volume in through the week. Yeah, like, we'll try three times more, that week. More, probably. Yeah, three sets of 10. I think there's, there's another question like later that comes into the same sort of thing, so I won't go into it too much, but yeah, potentially like, if you if you're going in like hammering a muscle, um, like that kind of like traditional bro split sort of thing, you go in and smash like one muscle over. Yeah. Potentially you might be better off um, increasing frequency um, and maybe cutting down a little bit on the volume um, and potentially throwing more muscle groups together in the same session rather than just going in and training like two muscles or etc. Anyway, the actual question was, um, yeah, like is it is it necessary to put in the cardio um, into a waist? Sort of strength program and it basically my, my answer would be it completely depends on your goals like if you're doing it from a fat loss perspective like absolutely not you don't have to have that cardio in there you can do that just through your diet and um, but if you've got more sort of athletic goals then yeah potentially you might need that and the, the other thing is as well what we've like talked about quite a bit recently is the conditioning side of it like if you're if you're doing your cardio and um, you're doing your high intensity training potentially you're building up a better work capacity, better conditioning to be able to allow you to do the actual weights in the first place and get through a little bit more. Mm. So I, I think cardio is great. Like, well, like if you've got your five sets of eight and you can't do eight because you're unfit, then not because you're not strong enough, yeah. then yeah, you need to do some cardio. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, going again a little bit into more um, specific detail, uh, so some people understand you've got two main fibre types of muscles, so you have your uh, slow twitch and fast twitch muscle groups. Um, those who are doing strength based training most often are the fast switch and then your second group is going to be more of your endurance based training. Um, I think I have slow twitch. <laughs> <laughs> just 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the important uh, bits of information is that there are latent fibers, fibers that take on um, the nature of the fiber type that you train. So to keep it simple, if you train for strength, more of your fibers are relevant to strength, and if you try and train for endurance, more of them are relevant for endurance. So if you are, like you say, if goals are completely relevant, if you're training 100% for strength training, you want to be, your one rep max is your goal, and then you go out and do a 10K run, yes, you are actually creating problems. That is not conducive to your main goal. Um, whether or not it's just because of you like doing runs, then if it was me, I used to like doing runs. That was well, well long. <laughs> <laughs> I still like those things, weirdly. I know, I care day. Um, but they, they, that is not conducive, and that would reduce your ability to perform well under the loads that you're going to be using in the training session. So I think, so, yeah, go over the point, obviously, like, potentially, even if you are kind of thin, like, yeah, you're, you're right, the, the end goal is, like, the one rep max, so if you're a week away, two weeks away, three weeks away from going for that one rep max, you're wasting your time going for, like, a 10k run, as you say, but potentially, like, further away from that in, like, a sort of off-season kind of phase, Running could potentially be a good thing to say you're building up that work capacity to then go into a, a high volume phase, um, and eventually, yeah, that's going to go more specific as you go along, um, and eventually you're going to peak, and that's yeah when it's you're not you shouldn't be going for like a 10, 10k run the day before power for me sort of thing. I mean, if you're a, you're a strength athlete, there are a lot of things that cardio forms that are very relevant. So things like ball training, um, stuff with a sled, um, or just the high rep work that's relevant. That sort of stuff is far more conducive to a strength athlete, but for the general people who are going to watch this, for the general public, if you want to get stronger, there is no reason you can't do that phase of training. We do it, yeah, do yeah, it yeah, run the high volume yeah. work. Um, but for those of you, for instance, my clients who I will force to watch this video, um, <laughs> yeah, I've already made recommendations of pool based sprints um, that's not high impact on the joints. Um, sprint work with a sled at 30% maximal load. Um, yeah, there's just stuff that would be a bit more fitting. Yeah, beneficial. You're just going for and deal with the doms in another way. You're done. <laughs> what is the best? If you had to choose one exercise for the rest of your life, Do what are you going to do? Choose one. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so for general public, I'd have to say the squat, which makes me really, really sad. And then the best exercise in terms of what is just the most intense, uses the most muscles, requires the most energy. That's got to be the deadlift. Yeah, can't break. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I'd go, yeah, deadlift is most intense, right. but if you want um, the best exercise for round purpose, it has to be the squat. Uh, there's too much, uh, the, the phrase functional is thrown around quite a lot, but if the general public can make a lot more use of the squat, the squat can be done at a high frequency, it can be trained more often, it can relate to far more things, so if you look at sport-based performance, there is a higher correlation between the squat and sprint time, the squat and jump times, the squat and, well I say this, I've just done my dissertation to say that's bullshit, but, uh, <laughs> Definitely gonna fail now. Hear your entire thing make sure I'm not being true. <laughs> That's fine. Um, the squat has more variations that can be changed to more specific lifestyle, except for the trap bar deadlift. Um, the squat trains muscle groups, uh, joints in a way that taking them forward through their full range that relates to people with um, osteoporosis. Uh, if you have any sort of joint issues, you can apply the squat to a lot of things. I am a deadlifter, I'm, even though my squat's going to be my deadlift, it's going to be really sad. It's going to be better in some regards, my deadlift's going nowhere. But um, I would say that, yeah, the deadlift is definitely more intense. It's more so, uh, CNS um, loading. It can't be trained as frequently at high intensity. Um, I would say it can't even be trained the same way as the two other lifts. You could run a, a trained squat and then almost exactly the same. Yeah, 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 yeah pretty much exactly the same, same yeah. Um, and then, it's much higher, but it's a high risk of injury. Um, it is more taxing on areas of the body that the general public are going to be very wary of, whether or not they're right or wrong. Like, I mean, if people are saying they've got a back issue, they, they should deadlift. Um, mm. But, yeah, that's probably my take on it. Yeah, no, I'll say, I like, I like the question because I think there's, there's different ways of looking at it as well. Like, you can say, like, which is the best exercise. I like the way of looking at it. So, like, if there was one exercise that you would put into, like, anyone's program, like, there's not there's not one exercise that you should be into everyone's program and use everyone's individual. But yeah, if you like basically, I'll, I'll go for squat because obviously, yeah. like, squat's like more relevant to other things, as you say. But then, if I personally, or like a lot of people, if you could only do one exercise, you could like only choose one exercise, I'll probably go deadlift. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Or bench. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> decision. Yeah, yeah, pretty much happened. No, um, yeah, so yeah, good question, but um, we didn't really answer it. <laughs> squat. <laughs> I think squat. Squat's the best exercise, then it's cooler. Yeah, so. Unless you super. So, squat and deadlift would be good if you can do both. <laughs> so, like.
Um, no one's going to watch this. <laughs> Ben's question that he sent in was, why aren't I massive yet? <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> I actually spoke to him about it as well in our session, and like, it, he meant it in the same way that like we received it as well. Like, he didn't just send it just to be stupid, even though it's quite funny. But um, he just meant it in a way of like, obviously he's, he's new to, well, he's not new to weight training, he's so getting back into weight training, like, basically saying like, how, how long does it take to, to put on some decent muscle size, like, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, progressive overload, um, putting on good sort of lean tissue potentially takes a long time. Um, I think it's quite easy to sort of like look bigger or look smaller depending on like your, your sort of fat percentages and that kind of thing. You can potentially look a bit bigger quite quickly. You're actually being really sad about this rock. Oh, don't eat it at the moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, realistically, like as I say, get, getting getting big and putting on muscle does take like a long time. Um, I think in terms of what to do to get there, the same thing as what we're kind of trying to portray here. Get your basics right first, be consistent with those. Make sure your your training is progressive. Don't just train for the sake of training. Like make sure you've actually like got a goal that's maybe strength related or um, you know related to your overall volume, time under tension, something like that. Like make sure that's progressive, um, and you will get there. Let's say I don't know the definition of massive, but like <laughs> big, yeah, potentially like obviously. You, and, and the other thing I go through as well is you, you're most likely to see. Um, the majority of your, your sort of strength gains, your hypertrophy gains as well within probably your first year of training as opposed to after that. Um, I mean, if, if you're a natural athlete and you have no intent of using steroids, you better be patient if you want to be big, like an actual yeah, size. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I've been training for five years and I'm massive and it didn't, it happened quite fast. Yeah. Well, is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with that, I was thinking about something else. I didn't even... <laughs> no, but I, think... I mean, I was not listening to a word you're saying. <laughs> thinking about something else. <laughs> Sorry. Effectively, yeah, you just need to be a bit more patient. Like, my goals aren't based around <laughs> size so in my own show. Um, but, yeah, and then you need, you need to be aware of, like Aaron was saying, um, again, a, a, a less polite version because I'm good at that. Um, if you're the guy that goes to the gym and you do a 3 by 10 on your bench, then you do three drop sets, and then you do your flies, and you do one other pushing exercise, and you do that every single week, I can guarantee you, you won't be massive anytime soon. You won't be strong anytime soon. Uh, if there is no element of progression, so if you're not tracking total volume, if you're not tracking the change in weight, if you're not uh, tracking the actual time to perform, so um, progressive overload is like seven different versions of tracking it, but um, if you want to look at it as the time it took you to get the same session done, the same weight moved, if there is no progression, you're making yeah, no like, Yeah, like, as I said, like, potentially, as someone who's new to it, you will see progression, um, which is why yeah. a lot of people stick with what they're doing and then get frustrated because they're pushing harder and harder and harder and don't really get anywhere. Like I will go over it because something I always want to go over. Like don't be that guy who sort of goes in, has like a chest day, hits up the chest, takes the first bench set till absolute failure. Hello. I'm just gonna feel you for some. Um, and then potentially like ruins the potential workload for the rest of the week. Like. Think of it as a as an overall thing. Like, don't don't rush into it each session at a time as well. So, like, if you're um if you're going in and you're bench pressing once a week and you have like a chest day and you're taking your first set till failure, that's you done for the week. Your your triceps, your chest, potentially aren't really going to get a lot more work. Um, whereas what you kind of want to do is is you know have an achievable session, maybe hit that two three times a week. That's where it comes into splits. So like. It's not, it's not always the best thing um, to hit like one muscle at a time. I mean, saying I was gonna, I think I told Callum a few weeks ago that like, I used to have a day when I first started training for for biceps. It wasn't, it wasn't even back of biceps. It wasn't arms. It was, it was bicep day. Oh, and I used wow. to go in and I used to curl from like nine different angles and different machines and everything necessary. like that. Oh, absolutely necessary. That's but, why he's massive. Yeah, that's why he's. <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah, not not the best way of going about it. Realistically, my my overall volume that I was training for you know beneficial things was very very low. Um, so you could potentially be better doing maybe an upper lower split, or maybe just putting a couple of muscle groups together and training them multiple times through the week. But actually looking at your intensity and being able to get through higher volume rather than just going crazy and doing the first set. Yeah, I got hungry. Do you want to add anything? I stopped listening to that. Yeah, I know. I kind of sort of myself up. Well. <laughs> what, what question are we talking about? <laughs> why, why not massive? Oh, why not massive, yeah. Um, 
don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably because it you're relatively, yeah. yeah, you just you're natural and it takes you. It takes like actually. Well, sorry, mate, what we will say is like I was Ben sent in a question. You probably won't obviously say his name. Like I was in the gym with him yesterday, and um, he was saying that. He follows another one of my friends on Instagram, like Will Carter. Mm. Um, he might watch this video to be fair. Ben. He's in America, and Ben, which is really cool to be fair, because Ben was like, "Oh yeah, that guy's done really well. Like, um, how like, how long's he been doing it? Like, I I want to get somewhere near that." And I was like, "Well, Will's been doing it for like eight years. Like, that's like, well, I, I don't know. You might correct me, but I think he's probably been doing that since he was like sort of 16, 17. Um, so that's potentially like." Because he was, yeah, like fairly sort of slim, like skinny, and now he's in like really, really good shape. Um, and that's, yeah, it takes. That's the thing though, most people look up to life. people in this industry. Mm -hmm. You look up to one or two people, people who have trained for minimum 10 years, or you look up to people who have trained for an incredibly long time but have been on steroids. Like, most of the people in this industry are not new to it, they've been in it for a long time. Tell yeah, you before you're a yeah, fan yeah, of like yeah. Daniel and Bailey. She's been in this industry for a huge amount yeah. of time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even listening to the podcast and from stuff from other guys, like, mm. most of them didn't even break into anything until they're in like their 30s. They'd already been, had like 10 years training experience. But the thing about us, I mean, we, we've been training for like quite a number of years. Like, I've been in the gym sort of on and off since I was like, like 13, 14, really. I've been in since I was 19. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't have a clue what I was doing at that time, but like, I've been in the gym for that amount of time. And, it's only got to this point, like sort of ten years down the line, where I'm actually feeling confident enough to answer questions. So the whole thing takes a long time. Like um, I, mean, I was answering questions when I was an idiot. But... <laughs> oh yeah, so I was, I was probably telling someone. <laughs> I was probably telling people stuff. But it probably didn't make sense. But... A more um, succinct answer, by the way, to the um, concept of actually making natural potential growth. Omar Risa, the YouTuber, answers that much faster than we did. Just say no. <laughs> No worries, it answers that a lot faster. Oh really? Yeah, I don't oh, think right. he had a more succinct answer. So. Yeah, maybe go to other people. Well, I was gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say one of the things. So obviously, we're not rehearsing this. I haven't read his questions. He hasn't read mine. Yeah. Um, so this is off the top of our heads and the answers we would give to clients. So if there's anything we say that you don't agree with, um, that's fine. Um, and if there's anything that we miss, feel free to comment it, write it below, add it in, um, and debate it with us if you want. Yeah, and to be fair, like, I. I think this is quite a big thing for us to do this, so it's big for me to anyway, because I'm always worried that if I did something like this, I'd say something that's potentially wrong. It's going to happen, like there's going to be information oh, yeah. that comes out of my mouth that I'm not even necessarily thinking about and it's not going to be the right thing. Like, don't be that guy who sort of takes information, plays on it and, you know, well, it, this is wrong problem. sort of thing. Yeah, like, there will be stuff that we say that's going to be like, mm, I'm not sure, but at the same time, like, we're trying to give out the best information possible. Um, I mean, I'm an ass as well, so I'm probably going to make a point of tearing that person. Yeah, I can imagine you will. But... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to give the best answers we can. I think most of these so far have been pretty relevant. Yeah, as I say, like the questions that we're using are all questions that have been given to us by, by our clients or by people that we've got through like social media and stuff. Um, and if you want stuff in more detail, again, just ask about X part. So if you're talking about like the squat deadlift we did, if you want more succinct information, I can give you some of the EMGs and some of the studies on exact muscle group um, activation. But Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> 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 I don't think this was easy as I expected. The questions we got oh, yeah, was from good. one of my clients. Like, yeah, still, still recording. <laughs> it's been so long. Uh, it's about our powerlifting idols, so who we look up to in the sport of powerlifting, strength training. I will make it broad. Actually, I might make it broader so you can talk about the fact that yours aren't all strength training. Well, keep it powerlifting, right? Otherwise, like, well, I could get carried away with that. <laughs> I like football. <laughs> um, do you have any? Well, powerlifting. Mm. I don't know about idols, not something I'm necessarily thought about, but I'll, should I go first because you're probably likely to spend more time with this than me. I don't yeah, necessarily have the really idols, idols well. but I'd say yeah, in terms of like people we look up to, I think for both of us as well, probably Chad Wesley Smith, mm -hmm. in terms of like, just like unbelievable coach. Um, I'd say that's someone that we in a sense idolise, because we both like, that he has an exceptional field of knowledge, um, a great deal of influence in this sport and has the sort of role that we're looking to get to. He's, he's done the practical side of it as well, which I yeah. really like, like he is an animal at the same time. <laughs> and uh, like he's done all of that. Um, and puts out like, yeah, like ridiculously good information. Like, you know, we've, we've both bought his books and everything like that. Um, and he has what we want of a team of athletes, very successful athletes, mm. his own place where he trains people. Yeah. Um, if you don't know who he is, I suggest go look him yeah, up. Yeah, definitely. But I'll tell, yeah, I'd, I'd say in a way that is sort of an idol, isn't it? Because that's someone I definitely aspire to be like that in terms of mm. career more than like I, I don't see myself as a powerlifter though, if I'm being honest. But like 
Yeah, like is it? What are you doing in like? Oh, bench competition. <laughs> <laughs> but like, for, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's different for me. Like powerlifting yeah, is different. like your thing. It's not necessarily like. It's, I love powerlifting, but it's not. Um, it's not my sport. But yeah, definitely is. It's someone like overall to look up to. I mean, you can't really look past that. Someone who's you know got like you know the practical side of it there, but he's done all the he's done the coaching bits. He's yeah, very knowledgeable as well. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, there, there will be. It's just trying to think of them on the spot. I mean, um, well, I'd go. So if you want to, so people relevant to me that I would say I idolise. I don't anymore, which is a little bit mean, I suppose. Um, but the first person I ever idolised in the sport was Richard Hawthorne. Um, he's like a 68 kilo lifter. Yeah, insanely fucking strong. Um, yeah, he was. He was the first person I saw who could be small and strong. I didn't know that was a thing because you think powerlifting, you think he's bare more than men who are fat. Um, lifting heavy weights and uh, yeah, there's a few of them, I don't get me wrong. Um, but the sport was far more broad than that and that was kind of the first time I saw it and saw that you know I could actually stay roughly the weight I am and be relatively strong. So that was pretty amazing to me, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, in terms of intellectually then yeah you've got people like Chad Wesley Smith who's pretty amazing. Um, people I just like appreciate in the sport, people like Omar Asa. Yeah, yeah, great yeah, material, yeah. Silent Mike. Um, they're yeah. standard YouTubers. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like all those guys. They are a good source of knowledge, don't get yeah. it wrong. They're not people I idolise um, because they themselves are informed by other people. I want to be one of those people who produces the information. Um, and then you have. I don't know what I look up to. Well, actually, saying that, so my first powerlifting competition, um, fangirling slightly, when I went, it was Alex Fader and Luke Rogers, who are two competitive uh, powerlifters. Both were in the 75 kilo class, I believe Luke's just moved up to the 82s. Um, incredibly strong guys, people I idolised, um, and I did chase and steal one of Alex Fodor's records, which made me kind of happy. Um, I apologise if you do watch this. Um, but yeah, they're the people I looked up to, and that, I think that's one important thing in the sport is that not looking up, so not having people you put on a pedestal, because there's that whole phrase of um, to your idols become your rifles. And I didn't want to just, I didn't look up to these people in one way, I just wanted to be on their level. And it kind of inspired me that there was a lot more I could do with the sport. So don't get me wrong, as much as I think powerlift is all awesome, there's no one I want to come second to. So I don't idolise idolize them as such, I just, I am, I appreciate them, I think they're fucking awesome. Ah, uh, did you come up with any others? Eddie Cohen, the goat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my pizza. Yeah, like, as I say, just all days, all the guys about really cool information. And have you know the podcast and the YouTube and everything like that. Like we we always listen to Mark Bell stuff. Like he puts out some really entertaining stuff. Um, don't really know of that. That's about it for that. I could literally list off like every powerlifter that's strong, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I don't think I just I think that's just an appreciation for a either intelligent training, yeah. um, or people just have a good impact on the sport. I don't yeah, yeah. care. Like strong for the sake of strong, I think it's cool. But I don't have an interest in it. Um, like you take, uh, and this is what I don't mean to just like disregarding the work people do. They're not for me. Um, but if you take like Eddie Hall, who is awesome, pulls 500 kilos. Massive appreciation for the work he does. I mean, I'm a massive fan of him. I think it's just cool. Um, but if so the people who it's got to be relative to what you want to do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, like that's exactly it because I want to make a good impression on sport. I want to teach people stuff. So the people who are doing those things are the ones I would look up to. Oh, I Two questions that I'm going to tie in together. Um, one just about how comp day works, so in powerlifting, and one about competition day nerves and how we deal with that sort of stuff. Um, so much for you. Um, I'll go first just because um, again you'll probably have more to say on it because I'm not that experienced in terms of powerlifting. I've still got people around when I'm talking. You cretin. Hold on, I'll fast forward from now. <laughs> yeah, um, till now. Mine's pretty basic in terms of like the competition day stuff. So I say I'm, I'm not that experienced with, with doing powerlifting competitions themselves. Um, I prefer like doing proper programs, I'm doing programs for powerlifting competitions. But in terms of what I would do, um, if if you are generally really really nervous, make sure that when you go in, if it's like your first competition, your second competition, make sure you go in in your first attempt at each lift, the lift that you can make. On the worst day as possible, like if 
you're feeling terrible, you can still go in, you can nail that lift. Like, I, I remember hearing something like, a couple of years back at the start with me, just said, like, your, your first attempt should be something you can do for at least a triple in the gym. Um, which obviously isn't, there's no accuracy on that, but I think it's quite cool just because, like, yeah, you want to be able to go in, you want to be able to do that weight, because if someone's nervous, and then they've also got to think that actually that weight that I'm approaching the squat for my first attempt, I might not even be able to get it, I'm going to have to grind this out. Probably not going to be <laughs> ideal for your nurse. Um, so like, yeah, make sure you've got something you can hit. That's what I'd say, really. I don't know. Um, okay, so Compto Nerves, so I can be about 10 times, I don't really know. Um, and I'm always nervous to some degree. But I found there's two things that make a massive difference to how I approach the actual bar. Because frankly, you're going to be relatively nervous anyway, because if you give a damn, you should be. Um, but one of the things that uh, helped me a lot in what the first competition I ever did calmly was having other people there competing with me. So if you're part of a team, like, you lose so much of your stress when you're screaming for your friends. Um, so when we're all going to compete as a team, there's going to be like half a dozen of us, not half a dozen, two dozen of us, a dozen, two dozen. <laughs> 24. <laughs> well. Maths is hard. <laughs> Food, come on. Um, yeah, so there's going to be a group of us which is going to take away the nerve for a lot of people because if you're screaming to your friends, you don't have time to freak out about how he's doing. And when you see your friend do well, you do well, all that sort of nonsense, which is really helpful. Um, and I did that with my client Helen, where my entire focus was on her competition day, and then I set like five British records that day because I just chill and nothing stressed me out. Um, and then I would say the things on a, a higher level, so those of us who are competing for very specific numbers, because obviously the first competition, you just you just going for a bit of fun. Yeah. It doesn't matter too much. There's not much relying on it. Um, but the competitions where I've gone at World Championships or where I'm there to break a record, the thing that makes a massive difference is visualization. So uh, even now, I go to sleep every night, and I don't know how to do this. Incredibly sad. No, no, I know you go to sleep every night. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so every night I say the same thing to myself, not exaggeration. I close my eyes and go 190 squat, 135 bench, uh, 245 uh, deadlift. And I tell myself my openers every single day. And then every time I go to the gym, I visualize having the commands. I visualize doing the same thing. Like successfully making them. Yeah, so you have to, in your head, know you're going to make that lift. You have to know your numbers and you have to know the day inside and out. You want as little of it to be a surprise as possible. So I know every possible outcome of that competition from bombing out to every lift I may or may not make and what number I would go to next. Um, you don't want anything to be a surprise. So for those of you who are just a bit scared and want that in control, I would suggest getting a coach um, who can make those decisions for you and think it through for you. Because frankly on the day you're gonna be a little bit freaked out mm -hmm. and you want someone who can just take some outside perspective and decide that for you, which I've never had. Which yeah, well, really yeah. No, I mean, I did when I did it, even just like someone to tell you, like, you've done that a million times, go in and do that, and then we'll sort out the next yeah, time. Yeah, and then thing. they can usually judge your speed and tell you what to do next. Yeah, exactly. Um, Shall I go through the comp day as a whole of what it is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, very briefly, I'll go through comp day because it's a little bit much. I'd suggest look some of it up online so you have more information. Basic premises, you weigh in relatively early. Most weigh-ins are around 8.30. Uh, within an, uh, that way in is to decide what category you're going to be in. About an hour later, lifting starts, usually through the women, the lighter men, and the heavier men. Uh, lifting can be in different orders, so it can be everyone does squat, bench, deadlift straight through, or uh, in their groups, or it um, can be everyone squats, everyone benches, everyone deadlifts. So that one can be a little bit more spaced out. A powerlifting competition day can be really long, or it can be relatively short. I've been in competitions where it's five hours, competitions where it's 12 hours. Um, so be prepared for every eventuality. So when I train the gym for three hours, that isn't actually an unconscious decision. It's knowing that I can stay awake for that long of lifting heavy yeah, things. Yeah. Um, I guess that brings in, like, sorry, I was going to say, like, what, what to bring with you in terms of like, food, hydration, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, caffeine. <laughs> yeah, I would bring caffeine. I would also bring in, uh, reduce the amount of protein you're taking in on the day because the digestion rates, you want readily available carbohydrates. Um, but not things like just sugar, like uh, cereal bars, stuff that's going to be relatively high in sugar. <laughs> not just sugar, I oh. literally a spoonful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're not joking. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's there. Um, yeah, then there's a whole kit check of what you have to wear and so on. But you'll go up, you'll do your attempt. Uh, within a minute, usually, you have to tell the judges what your next attempt is going to be and so on. And then you get a break between lifts normally to some degree. Usually it's squat, then bench, then a break, and then deadlift. Um, and then there's an award ceremony at the end. To keep it relatively simple, it is a lot more in depth than that. Um, it is a huge amount of fun. If you're with people you enjoy, it is amazing. I did my last competition a couple of months ago. It was the worst competition I've ever done for me. Um, it didn't go badly as such, but I just performed really poorly. Um, but I had the most fun because there were two guys there who I chilled with and his wife all day. Um, 
uh, dance squat actually, and we just paced around the whole day and it was a huge amount of fun and I didn't really care about the lifting. That's good though. Yeah, it was, that was fantastic. That's probably enough on that. Yeah. <laughs> actually, to be fair, I've just realised I've written this so I can condense like three of these questions into the same question. Um, or two. Yeah, two I'm, of them. I'm going to keep trimming all this until you decide what you're going to do. I've decided, I'm just talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, number three that I've got, and number eight that I've got. <laughs> don't know what Nancy said this because they're pretty much exactly the same question. One of them is uh, is animal protein the same as eating. Um, <laughs> I, put, I put is animal protein the same as eating protein from meat? <laughs> I think I was meant to say is animal protein the same as eating protein from plants? I think was the question. Um, like plant protein, mm -hmm. kind of soy and stuff. Um, and then the other question I've got is, is, is protein the same uh, no matter where, from where you get it from, um, for example, steak or whey protein? Um, so there's two ways of looking at that, like from like the, what we're doing, which I guess is more the body composition route mm -hmm. that we're looking at at the moment, um, no difference in terms of like protein to protein in terms of, in terms of as a calorie. Um, however, again, it comes down to that thing. So like if you are, at that point where you can afford to look at like, the next things like what, what nutrients you need um, everyone should have obviously a, a very diet anyway and be nutrient dense but um, if you're e eating all your protein from like whey potentially you're missing out on nutrients that you could get from like red meat and steak um, and efficiency yeah like exactly that. and that's, that's the same for every protein source you can miss that's, like, that's why it's important to, to keep it varied um, but no in, in terms of like Body position, protein is protein, like don't overthink it, but at the same time, try and make it as varied as you can because you don't want to be missing out on loads of different nutrients and stuff like that. Um, yeah, no, there's a part of research of this that I should know. Oh, you're just going to make my thing completely wrong, but that's good. But it, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. No, I don't know, so I would have come from the same standpoint. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I train uh, a vegetarian, a vegan, um, someone who just doesn't like meat as a whole, which I think is the same thing, I'm just wrong. Um, <laughs> So much great. Um, um, <laughs> me. Um, but the issue is so, uh, if you look at BCAAs, things like that, so the, the breakdown of um, protein, the amino acids you get through a plant based source are very different from what you get from uh, an actual meat protein based source. Um, Any sort of artificial protein is the same sort of issue. So, I, and I don't know the science on the top of my head. I know there is a huge variance and I know that affects people, but there are ve uh, vegan bodybuilders. There are. Um, but then there's the whole question of whether or not they're building muscle or sustaining. Oh, so I think it's only saying that still comes into what I was saying in terms of like, you know, you, you were saying the amino acid style structure yeah. of things. That's again, that make sure it is varied. Like that's what I'm saying. Like could potentially be different, and you know, the protein could could you know react slightly like differently. But at the same time, just try and make sure it's varied yeah. and. Don't look into that stuff if you haven't nailed this stuff. Oh think, yeah, yeah. Like, don't so, I say that a lot. I, I might go into too much detail, but um, like we're still going to stand for the basic premise. If you can get protein as a whole correct, then start to look into the specifics yeah. of there and saying. Um, but if you can't nail getting in an appropriate amount of protein per day, yeah, don't worry about where it's then, coming from. Yeah. yeah. Well, do things things. You want to obviously don't want to encourage people just to eat protein bowls all day long and stuff. You still yeah. want to eat like nutrient dense food, but don't overthink your protein sources. Just have a good variety of. Um, should we go into how much protein you should have? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't know. <laughs> so, we have too much. Yeah, we've probably overdone it a little bit. Um, yeah, just to cover very briefly protein intake, so there's a lot of different ways people are doing this and people like Aaron, Alan Aragon um, cover in great detail of research exactly how much protein you should have. Um, in a very simple version, it either tends to be 0.7 to 0.9 grams of protein per pound of body weight or 1 gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. Um, Effectively, if I weigh 160 pounds, roughly 160 grams of protein, it's rough. Uh, you can play with it quite a lot, and I don't know, again, I'm kind of annoyed that I don't, the exact science of what numbers you should pick. Um, and then there's things about protein intake per meal, um, 40 grams seen as optimal and so on. What we're doing is not optimal, we're taking in all of our protein in one. Yeah, that was something we really wanted to address. Yeah, like, we we're up. obviously eating everything. <laughs> we're eating everything. <laughs> We're eating our entire probably. daily intake, um, probably within what two hours by the time we finish it, if that sort of thing. Um, 
this is purely again just to highlight the basics of, of nutrition. We're getting our calories in, we're pretty close to our macros. However, it's not ideal. Like, as I say, like, you know, protein synthesis and stuff, you want to make sure you're spreading, spreading your intake out throughout the day a little bit. Um, again, like in terms of your sort of like carbs and fats, it's not really too you know, relevant what what kind of time you're eating it in terms of uh, your training time of day, that kind of thing. A lot of people say no carbs late in the evening or avoid carbs together, that kind of thing. Like, no, like that's not not where we're coming from. But in terms of like Strong. being optimal, <laughs> yeah, being optimal, um, you know, your protein intake spread out throughout the day a little bit more. Um, and in terms of your your training as well, like, you know, timing your carbs around your training, that kind of thing. It, it's just that loss, that last sort of little percent, like get this right first. Like a lot of people like, this sounds ridiculous, but I, I generally think a lot of the people that are chopping and changing a lot of the things and they're going up and down and yo-yo and that sort of stuff, if they did this with their calorie intake, like in the middle of the day, they'd probably Literally. get a lot further. Is it, they always do the same like people do intermittent fasting, you're doing the same principle, it yeah, well, yeah, yeah. difference. Yeah. But if you're prepping for a bodybuilding show, you're about to compete in the Olympics, like get it right, time it out a little bit better, yeah. make sure your fiber intake's good, your sugar intake's not too high. Um, but frankly, the people watching this are not those people. Um, I don't know many people are going to watch this who are elite athletes um, who rely on it. I know a lot of people who watch this and are getting the basics wrong. Um, and That's what we're doing. Now. Yeah, again, we wanted to show that, like, this isn't. I feel like Aaron's enjoying himself. I'm actually struggling more than I expected. I just remember talking about nutrition and me and Pete's off. <laughs> but that's the point, like. <laughs> And this is, that's the other bit we want to cover. So we are flexible dieters. I also hate that it's got a category like everything else, but it's what people call it. So flexible dieting, where you incorporate things that you want into your lifestyle. Because frankly, I'm not an elite athlete. I'm assuming Aaron's not calling himself an elite athlete. I don't want to speak for you. Have you seen those trophies? <laughs> I don't know if they're in frame. No, you can't get them. I've got, I've got a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. Um, but we're not people who are focused on that sort of information. So, especially from powerlifting. Perspective. Yeah, it's goal specific as well. Like mm. our sport doesn't it doesn't require it. It's it not it's not a necessity. Yeah, yeah. It, it would help. Like it would help, but it's not like at the end of the day. For me personally, like I love food. Life is too short. Like, and this is a way for me to get as close as I can to my goals um, without you know having to do some silly restrictive restricted diet. There's nothing against that kind of thing. Well, I have to say that Atkins bar yeah. was fantastic. <laughs> it was that. Uh, yeah, mine that was, was the best thing I've eaten. Yeah, so yeah, far. That's actually right. Go on Atkins, do we? <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried um, I don't know where we got to that from. No. Oh, well. Stuff. There. Be healthy. <laughs> Be healthy, eat a broccoli. Yeah, just eat a whole broccoli. Uh, I'll get back to that. Um, yeah, that's probably all right for that question. Uh, yeah. What, I, I, I get to the end of every question, I'm like, what was the question? <laughs> Did we answer it? <laughs> don't really know. Oh, that was the meat sauce protein. Oh, yeah. <laughs> meat sauce. No. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, Genuinely don't know that. That's, <laughs> we should leave it there. That's enough. Good. Uh, <laughs> I was no, joking. Do not know any more into that one. Um, mate, just give me a shout if you want to do one of your ones. Otherwise, I'll just keep Apple one. going through them. Okay, we'll see. Oh, okay. No, we can do this one very quickly. Yeah. Um, should you qu curl in a squat yeah, rack yeah, or a power rack? I'll come back. Okay. Um, Eric, because <laughs> was it? Should you curl in a squat rack or a power rack? Yeah. I'll say I'll say go with the cliche. Do the squat rack. Why is it taking so long? <laughs> yeah, I took a little while to think about that. <laughs> Neither you, you special child. Leave it alone. Get out the fucking rack. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Oh, are you talking to the best answer? We're going to be special. <laughs> you you, you are the power rack. <laughs> <laughs> I said squat rack, don't be ridiculous. So reasonable, my apologies. Yeah. Um, I've none of the above. Right there, there's no else to do it. Why are you doing curls? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I feel like we can't answer that one. Um, good question. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Maybe you kind of want to say like something, do you know what I mean? Like the answer is right. totally like okay, a genuine answer. Um, use the score rack so you're less in the way of power rack can be used for more things. Yeah, and I'd say in terms of cutting in a rack, time efficiency, energy expenditure, yeah, you're not having to pick it up on the floor, and you're probably risking it. It, not risking injury, picking up the weight. Well, the power rack, you can probably adjust the height a bit more. The score rack's kind of limited up to this sort of Yeah, height. I'd always go to the power rack. <laughs> no, 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 I've got power rack. Power rack, I think you've got a power rack. Yeah, go on power rack. <laughs> But um, 
do you have to uh, add in cardio whilst training with weights for weight loss? Um, which I feel bad because I think we've already kind of covered this, but um, yeah, it's yeah, sort of covered it in one of the other questions. Um, for weight loss specifically, like, no, you don't. Um, you can just lose weight, lose fat through through your nutrition, through your diet. Um, yeah, you don't actually, weight. like, this is the worst thing I'm going to say today. You don't have to go to the gym to lose weight. No, no, no you don't. I no. do my mum's nutrition, I did, but she followed it. In six months, she lost 10 kilos, she's never stepped foot in a gym. Um, because she increased her calories. So again, is that even more like, I know it sounds ridiculous again, but even more like what we're trying to say is like, it's so basic that some people probably don't even have to spend the time in the gym. Yeah, you I, we don't, we don't like, want to take away from people exercising. No, but the people but, are like, oh, if you want to get healthy, or if you want to get fit, you need to go to a gym. Yeah, yeah. If you want to be healthy, you actually do need to go to a gym because you need to prevent things like osteoporosis. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, but if you're just genuinely there for fat loss because um, you were trying to change your lifestyle, if the gym doesn't fit your schedule, that is not an excuse not to lose weight. Yeah, get get this right first, get eat your pizza. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> so, regularly. Um, no, that we're just cut out. So effectively, if you want to lose weight, it is more efficient to do the diet right and to go to the gym. If you can't go to the gym, that's not an excuse not to lose weight. You can absolutely do it through just your diet. Same thing, we are constantly saying, get the basics right first and then deal with the rest of it. I got asked was, just about covering bracing. Um, this is, I'm actually going to say some really power to but it's not so ridiculous comment. Um, what a joke you are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm not talking. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so bracing, basically covering um, the concepts of uh, spine stabilization during major compound movements that incorporate uh, spinal loading. So this is, people will know more commonly within their squat, their deadlift, overhead press, um, lesser than that within their bench, but it's the concept of creating um, stability around your spine. Uh, it can be taught in quite a lot of different ways. So for me, usually you'll see in a squat, which is just tensing of the abdomen, deep breath in, and forcing air out and trying to push in every direction for circumferential. Um, what's the word? Circumferential stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but basically pushing the abdomen. No. Uh, just pushing, so when you take your air in, you're not just pushing forward, you're not just tensing your abs. Yeah, 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 um, So usually it's quite easy to teach if someone's wearing a belt and you're pushing out into that belt. Um, most people, when they take a breath for any sort of movement, they take a deep breath, puff up their chest, all of this is weak, and this is the firm bit that they're trying to show off like a 14 year old boy in a playground. Um, what instead you want to be doing is taking air in and forcing down and forcing out. Uh, one of the ways I teach this, is, actually it's a varied way, so you can have someone breathe all of their air out until they feel like they're going to pass out and then take a deep breath through their nose. That tends to create tension just because the diaphragm movement um, and the tension it creates in your abdomen. Uh, if that doesn't work, you can just have someone imagine that you're about to punch them in the stomach, that tends to create some degree of tension. Um, it's drawing down the ribs to create a neutral spine as well. Um, it's a lot easier to teach hands-on. Anyone who's watched footage knows that that's not really enough. Um, just hearing an explanation of uh, bracing. Yeah, and it's, it, it is a movement. It does take practice as well. A huge amount. Yeah, it took me a good year at least. To I, get I still don't think I brace particularly well when I. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I think so when you squat. <laughs> oh, when you squat. Like, I don't squat. think you do. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to hurt you. <laughs> that wasn't from squat. Um, <laughs> that's from football. Football's bad. Yeah, for kids. same sport. <laughs> 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 I did actually have something to say. <laughs> I can't remember what it is. Um, oh wow. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, like a lot of the um, you should talk about like other guys in the gym and other guys training and stuff. But I think a lot of the time you see people try and brace, and they're making a very deliberate brace, but they're not necessarily putting the air into where it should be put. And it's like you said, a lot of it sometimes the chest comes out, they fill in the rib cage of air, which is tends to be not the natural thing, it's not what we should do, but what, what people tend to do. Um, and also, hyperextending the back as well. So like, I see a lot of people when they're filling the, the chest with air, okay. and then as they're filling the chest, trying to sort of accentuate the chest coming up, yeah. and then creating hyperextension in the, in the lumbar as well a little bit, which is then effectively gonna put you in a weaker position, especially the bottom of the squat, that's probably not what you want. Uh, yeah, it's probably not ideal. Um, it's, it's basically the same as, uh, you know, round and back deadlift, your, your, your lumbar's flexing. Um, basically, fill, <laughs> fill the air into the stomach. Um, 
And as, as Callum said, um, you know, you practice with a belt. It's like, I think you said there was a test done where it actually worked better without yeah. a belt. Um, with a, with a belt. But yeah, whenever I've thought anyone to brace, um, it just tends, for, for me personally as a coach, it tends to be a little bit better to, to show them with a belt because then they can actually see what's happening in front of them a little bit and they can feel it. Um, and then yeah, once you once you get used to that uh, way of bracing, it is gonna you you probably will see a lot of uh, stronger lifts. You see lifts go up a little bit. You'll feel stronger at the bottom. You feel a bit more controlled. Um, so you're trying to create basically a strong pillar because you want stacking of joints. Um, the issue, so when you're trying to create a good force output, everything needs to be as stacked as possible. Uh, so wrist through elbow through forearm, same thing applies to the entire body. So if you have a weak midsection, the force isn't being applied directly. Um, talking about the belt, so the study about a belt was basically looking at EMGs. So when people are saying that if you use a belt you're not training your abs, those people are stupid. Um, and I hope some of them watch that because I've seen those videos and they're fantastic. Um, that's completely my opinion, nothing to do with bar resistance. Um, <laughs> but no, so the, the whole thing about using a belt doesn't train your abs or anything. So there are uh, numerous studies now that show that when you're wearing a belt there is more activation of the uh, right, so abs. Yeah. more yeah. obliques without and, uh, no, Yeah, yeah, and more obliques without it. Yeah. Um, so it's like you train both but it, it is not an issue to use a belt and I really hate that myth. Um, yeah, I think we should train both ways. But yeah, but bracing as a whole is very, very important. Um, and it's called Valsal for breathing. Um, with certain people, do be careful with it. So if you've got high blood pressure, it's very relevant mm. that you're aware of it. It doesn't mean you can't create that midsection tension. It just yeah. means that the holding of air needs to be Yeah, don't addressed. go crazy with it. Like, yeah. I've seen, like, I've had it with some people, literally. No, no one's got high blood pressure, but where you try and get the point across and you see people basically take, try to take everyone's oxygen away from everyone. Get them around the room. <laughs> Um, obviously, like ease yourself into it. Learn, you know, you're just trying to create a bit of pressure. You're not trying to like steal everyone else's air. And good um, bracing can be done with just air through the nose. It doesn't have to be huge yeah, volumes of air. Yeah. Um, it's more about putting that to use um, and setting the air in the right place. Not that really you have a choice. Everything goes into your lungs. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like yeah. that more than anything. Like push the air out when you have a lung. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fill it into your lung. Yeah. But, yeah, it'll feel very different. You can be taught that by a good coach most of the time. But yeah, bracing is important. And I think in terms of like. <laughs> Funny enough, I got hurt here at the moment. But in terms of like injury prevention and stuff, like mm. it, it is safe to brace. It, if, if you're losing using a like heavy weight, you should be bracing. Uh, Massively dangerous not to. Yeah, I mean, um, the, you usually see the common faults you're going to see, like Aaron mentioned, uh, uh, hyperextension. If you're not bracing properly, <clears throat> a great deal of forward lean in the bottom of squats as someone hits the bottom, practically yeah, collapses forward. Uh, something goes. They're lifting a huge amount of arching in their back. Um, me. Um, <laughs> someone who uh, benches and can't create tension at the bottom, so as the bar comes down, everything's a little bit loose, sinks into them a bit more. Um, it is seen in a lot of different ways, but yeah, it's just worth addressing. Yeah, it's worth worth practicing, worth doing. A lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is a good question. To be fair, I really like it. It's um, again, like I just I didn't actually address this at the start of the video, but I'm just going to make the point that. Um, if you are an experienced like trainer and you, you have lifted weights for a while, you do go to gym a lot and you know your stuff, a lot of these questions like I'll come from people who are just starting out or and maybe getting back into it and you know, just appreciate that the, the questions are gonna be from all different levels, not just advanced lifters. So we we're, we're not gonna, you know, go too advanced with some of the answers, we're just gonna try and keep it relatively basic. I'd say most of it still has been advanced enough for 90% popular. Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been advanced, but in terms of like... It doesn't leap out if it wasn't. Yeah, but. and we wanna make sure that the people that are just starting up, uh, you know, this is the point of this video, is that we address the basics and get that right, and we wanna make sure that people can still understand us in terms of like... That's, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, it's a little bit annoying. <laughs> um, anyway, question number nine was, um, is it best to train different muscles in each session uh, so sort of like split or um, or full body uh, session um, and I kind of went over that a little bit earlier but it's it's a good topic um, so was at this um, di different muscle splits um, oh, okay. or, or full body splits which is a good question it depends on how often you're training um, how much time you've got um, what your goals are again a little bit um, but generally the the sort of like it's just a broad question again. Yeah, the mid. Yeah, I'm thinking so much about everything. The sort of like mid range kind of splits tend to work well for, for the general population. So I think going back to what I said earlier, if you're just training one muscle on one day, 
um, and then you're repeating that like week in week out. So you've got like a, a back day, um, nothing like that by the way, like a chest day, but twice a day, twice a day. You're very much limiting um, the amount of work you can get in overall um, during a week. Um, you're also limiting like we're going to sort of like practice and stuff as well. So if if you've got like one push day or a chest day or whatever, and you're bench pressing once a week, potentially like you're not getting as much practice as the movement as you should. Um, that comes into it a little bit. But yeah, I do think it's goal specific. So for example, like, um, again, she probably won't mind me saying, she's the one who sent the question, someone called Lauren who I train. Um, so at the moment she does two sessions a week, um, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and she does, she trains once a me and it's a whole body uh, session. And then she trains by herself once a week, which is a whole body session. The reasons that they're both whole body sessions is that if you're only training twice a week, um, that's a good way of getting in a good total training volume um, within within those two sessions. So, um, you know, I try and always put the most effective movements in someone's program. So you look at the things like the squats, the deadlifts, the presses, the rows, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're doing a full body session, you can get all of them in multiple times a week based on two sessions. Whereas if I was to change that to an upper lower split, um, which again is, is an absolutely fine way of training, um, possibly not the best thing for someone who's who's doing two sessions a week because you're probably limiting to the frequency, well you are limiting to the frequency, you're possibly limiting the amount of overall volume you can be able to get done as well. Um, in terms of training, like think of your training as sort of like a, a weekly, a monthly log rather than how much work you can get in an exact day because training one muscle until you're sore and training until you're hurting, um, you know, potentially you're limiting to how much you can do going forward in the next couple of days. Um, I think you should be myself now, so I think that's the... Yes, yeah, so the king principle of all training is going to be frequency, um, and then everything else is broken down after that. So you have your frequency, your intensity, your volume. Uh, so your volume, you go in and train one body part. Um, it's completely negligible. You're not creating a massive demand of the body. If it's demanded one day in a week, why would it adapt? Um, if your intensity is incredibly high, then that's going to like burn out pretty quick. And then you go into that own training principle again. Your frequency is the thing that is relevant to everyone, no matter what your sport. So if you're a balance, your strength training, if you're a swimmer, if you're a football player, your frequency is important. So if you're not practicing your skill set very often, it kind of sucks. Um, I, so what I was thinking about, and why I had a bit of a face on doing this, the, the training split, training eight body parts per week, which you very politically correctly said wasn't wrong. Who would that be good for? Anyone training just chest? Once a week? I, yeah, no, sorry. So I don't think, I don't think it's, um, yeah, so it's not wrong, is it? Like, oh, you're being polite, but it's, no, genuinely, is no, there anyone that would just... No, no, there, no there, there probably isn't anyone who'd benefit from that, other than if you maybe enjoy that way of training and that keeps you on track, like some people yeah, don't. Go, yeah, go in with the with the um, sort of mindset that they're going to go in and actually crush one muscle group, and they enjoy doing that, they enjoy the aggression, they enjoy that intensity, that's fine, if that's yeah. what it takes to do, keep it trapped, no, you're right, it's probably... I don't think there's a benefit Probably to... not a lot of people who would benefit from that no. way of training, even like, you know, we're not bodybuilding experts by any means, but even like bodybuilders probably not going to benefit from that way of training. Oh, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but if you took a bodybuilding, you still need to be a total volume per week. Yeah, um, exactly. Like it's not the same. It's not the same training volume as like powerlifters would do. No, the only people I'd say train legs once per week. If you're a competitive athlete and legs is only just kind of relevant. So if you're a football yeah, 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 yeah. maybe do legs once per week. Yeah, you can do it twice. Um, you don't want it to interfere with other skill sets. So you don't, you yeah. don't, so it, it, it's like I said, if you're a footballer, you can train legs once a week. If you're practicing football. Yeah, exactly. Football needs to be your main goal. Football needs to be like... Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goals. Yeah, um, the, ba the basic metaphor to break this down is if you were um, uh, a tennis player, would you go and play for six hours or for 30 minutes every day? Would you... Um, like just smash a ball over and then practice your serve and so on. You would practice that skill every single day to get better at it. Same as keeping your hobbies on football, like anything. Um, you are better off training that very, very frequently, so it's a practice mechanism, you know how to do it, rather than just smashing it for six hours. Um, I used to do that split, don't get me wrong. I was uh, chest, back, legs. I don't ever do it all day, is it? Can you tell? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I did it to that degree, but I definitely did the, the what everyone calls a pro split. It isn't efficient. Um, total volume per week is negligible, uh, and you can't really progress it because there's only so much you can do in one yeah, session. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, like if someone's smashing chest for an hour, the only thing, only thing you can change is either the amount of time you get it done. You can't increase your frequency because you're doing it once per week. 
Um, you can just maybe increase your volume, but then you've got to be there longer. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. That's what I was going to say. You've got to be there longer. Like, can you train? Realistically, can you train with high intensity for like one muscle group for like two hours? Because if not, then you're better off splitting those two hours into like four half an hours or whatever you want to do. Um, oh, the, the you know one way I'm looking at it is if uh, if you're two guys who are you're right, <laughs> if you're looking at uh, two guys who you know wanted to add 100 kilos onto their bench press in a year, both starting from the first of January, who's going to go further? The guy who benches three, four times a week and looks at their volume overall and progressing that, or the guy that benches once a week and goes in and maybe does like an extra set than the other guy would and maybe trains to a failure. That other guy is having, you know, four times as much sessions throughout the year, that's gonna add up a lot. His technical prowess is gonna be Yeah, far technical, higher. training volume, like everything's gonna be much, much higher, other than perhaps intensity. But yeah, potentially just just look at your frequency and your volume. Um, so I would say again coming back to the split, whole in that in that situation, whole body would be better. Um, but just look at the split relative to what your goals are and um, how much time you've got. Um, yeah, exactly what you're doing. So I I would avoid specific muscle groups um, unless there's any reason for it. Yeah, there's nothing. Unless there's some elements of rehab and you need to train chest for a change. Yeah, just, but even then you can probably do that as well as a full body session. Like you can just have that in sort of thing. It's called one man. Ah, unless you've got one man. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> Three hours later. <laughs> yeah, we've had some food today as well. Should we, should we cover it in detail? Yeah. Okay, so we just want to go through roughly what we have eaten. Um, partly for the foodies, um, partly to explain. Oh my god, the intake of food. Um, actually, I've tracked it, so I might just re read it out of what I've had. Do you want to just cover what you've got? Or is it no. Got? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so so far, um, the entire meal is going to conclude. We won't show you the whole thing because that's kind of boring. Um, a large Mexican Fiesta pizza, with about 1426 calories. Uh, diced breast from Tesco, chicken breast. Uh, 450 grams, 600 calories. Long grain classic rice with egg, a whole bag, 388 calories. An Atkins bar, low carb, key, 141 calories. A whole broccoli, which is a work in progress. I'm tired of it now. <laughs> 350 grams, it was only 140 calories for the whole sodding broccoli. And then the chicken asparagus risotto which is from the healthy living category is 367 calories. So about 3,100 plus the shake, which I did forget to track, which is good. That'd be that. the other 150, 100. That's me within 50 calories for the day. Yeah, I'll get some pizza cookies and steak. <laughs> You're a dick. <laughs> and some other stuff. An Atkins bar, oh, plus yeah, whatever Atkins that bar. is, and chili and rice. Yeah, another healthy living meal and a protein shake. So I think the calories are almost exactly the same. I definitely think the downside of eating all your food in one go is you get quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> this is hitting a fair amount harder than I still got, still got another question to go through. Yeah, we've got, what, one more? Yeah. Right, we'll do um, the one more question, then we're just going to figure out some fun. We'll lay down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's quite an ironic last question. <laughs> How much damage can a cheat meal do to your macros? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that intentionally? No. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, well. Yeah, how much damage can a cheat meal do to your macros? So how, how much damage can it do when you have a meal that's a little bit well, should over? Should we address what a cheat meal is first? And then yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, cheat meal, like, I don't, I don't know how deep you want to go into it. People get really funny about cheat meals. I don't know, saying, like, oh, the perception of saying some foods are bad and some foods is. I don't know if we want to get into that. Oh, so I come really simply. Because yeah. the cheat meal concept is a thing that came up with bodybuilders is that you eat really well like six days a week and then someone organises that you have a cheat meal where you eat the things that you're not allowed to eat because bodybuilders are very strict with what they eat regardless of their level, which I won't go into. Not all bodybuilders. A lot of them. <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> okay, no, it's a basic concept. A lot of people do it. So cheat meal is a really common thing. Um, the science behind it by some people is how it addresses leptin levels, how you perceive things like insulin, how you perceive psycho psychologically your diet so that you feel a bit more comfortable because after six days you can have something to feast and go outside your calories. A cheat meal isn't specifically within your calories. So the idea is you have a specific meal plan and one day 
cheat meal, well, one meal and one day for something about cheat day. You just go all out, have whatever the hell you want. Yeah, I think it's, the idea of it's more like psychological than anything, isn't it? Yeah, like, because the science becomes really full. Yeah, like if you get bored and you get fed up, like then just go crazy for a little bit and then come back to it. But obviously, when you get to the side of it, it's, you know. To go with the very simple side of it, if you are in a deficit for six days, and then on the last day you decide to go mental, you are no longer in a deficit, you've not lost weight. It's basically exactly how I was going to explain it as well. So I was like, no, 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 it's fine. Like, I was going to say, like, it's, the way I'll explain it is it says how, how much damage is going to do to your macro. It, it depends what the cheat meal is, how many calories are in the cheat meal, um, and how much is going over your, your calories. Really. So if you're, if you're someone that requires like 2,000 calories a day, um, let's say that, that's your deficit to lose weight, and uh, you're, you're hitting that six days a week, and then your cheat meal increases that by another 2,000 calories, so you've had 4,000 calories that day, you've probably then gone from being in a deficit to losing weight to actually going out of weight loss territory. To maintenance to probably even putting on weight so it really does depend uh, what the cheat meal is like how many how many calories over it is if you have for example like if you if you just had a pizza um, yeah like if you had if you had a pizza like a sort of regular sized pizza that was maybe a few hundred calories over your uh, intake and you you literally only did that once a week or maybe once every few weeks once a month whatever it's not going to do a whole lot of damage but it's just going to affect obviously your your total calorie intake for the week and for the month because Remember, it's not just your calorie intake in a day that's going to affect your weight loss, it's going to go over for weeks and months. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say. It, it, it basically depends on what, what the meal is um, and how many calories it has. And also from the perspective of how I eat or we eat, if you have a cheat meal, I already have a question about your diet. Um, so a cheat meal infers that every day of the week you are spot on and you're eating only good foods. And this is a bit that I don't think you want to go too much into. Um, but the flexible lifestyle, if you can't, if you have to cheat to eat something that you like, I would question your diet. Yeah, because it's whole. probably not, um, it's probably not like maintainable for, no. for the person. If you're, if you're having to cheat, um, I mean, again, we're, we're, we're going general population, so like, we're assuming the guys that are listening to us aren't like a week out from a bodybuilding show or like, you know, the highest level. What, what you're doing should be maintainable for a long amount of time, there's no point. Having like a diet, sorry, I'm just catching up. <laughs> I'm so dead. Having like a diet, having like a way of eating that you can't maintain, because that implies that at some point you're going to go back to old habits and you're going to rebound. Yeah, and I think, yeah, exactly. And I think cheat meal, cheat meal, there's a lot of potential for that to do. Like if you have the need for a cheat meal on your diet, then um, maybe have a look at your diet before. I, I get some people need that, they like the regimen of go 100%, you eat yeah, yeah, nutrient, yeah, 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 yeah. nutrient dense yeah. foods and you eat really well all week and yeah. then maybe you have a day to let go, but yeah. um, it isn't necessary, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, to be fair, like, like you said actually, I, I have trained people that have, um, even though they, they, they're they aware of all this, they're aware of the flexible diet and how it works, they still eat very, very clean, eat like well, um, eat nutritionally dense food because they're worried that if they do like have what like a packet of crisps or a chocolate bar they're then going to eat like 10 of them or whatever so i understand it from that point of view but yeah if if you do require a cheat meal in your diet look at your diet first i think um but then yeah the damage that it can do to your to your intake really does depend on what the cheat meal is yeah maybe even if, if the cheat so if you're going to do cheat meals maybe even just change the way you're interpreting it so if you have like a thousand calories left for the day and all week you are one of those people who likes to have nutrient dense foods fair play and then that meal that's still a thousand calories is just a different source like it's a pizza rather than it was going to be a yeah yeah rice. that's, that's yeah. going to do no damage yeah um yeah, yeah via sodium that. intake and stuff like that it's going to change how you feel yeah, for yeah. a day that that's not going to make a change whatsoever um and if you're one of those people complete you know, fair play respect to you um but do be aware of the calories over a week because that's you know science and that matters a bit of a full yeah I think we're pretty much done. Yeah. Yeah, we might yeah. Go lay down. And this is pathetic actually, because actually like if I look at this through normally, like I could sit here and eat a lot more food. I feel like the fact that I haven't eaten for like a few hours to start of the day and try to do it all within the yeah, space so of about this, an hour or two hours. This was easier conceptually. Um, to say that we are gonna do a food challenge at some point and do this properly yeah. and now film. <laughs> Um, You're joking. Yeah, no, is there anything we should say like, to finish it off? No, I suppose... Um, in terms of like, what we're oh, offering. Yeah, so well, the first cliche bit, because uh, I don't know YouTube that well, but the whole like, turn on notifications and all that rubbish, because we are going to produce more videos. Um, they won't all just be food. 
as much as I wish that was the case. Um, we'll do some training advice, we'll do some stories and so on. Um, so just make sure you subscribe to the channel and all that stuff and share and like and be good to human beings if you don't do it, I'll hunt you down. And all of our resistance. Yeah, we... <laughs> so, the whole thing is what we offer as a whole. So if those people who don't really get a good grasp of the nutrition or who are interested in what we do um, but don't really know how to start applying it, we both, we offer coaching together through Barber Resistance where we both handle your stuff. Um, we offer it independently. Um, if you like Aaron more than me, I completely get that. It's pretty reasonable. Um, and we want coaching from just him. You can approach Aaron. He's Elite Strength on Instagram. I'm just C underscore J underscore Barney. That's not very fluid, is it? I should change that. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can approach either of us for coaching. Um, I myself specialise in strength training, weight loss, muscle gain, simple bits. That's just such a cliche. Just teach you how to lift properly. Um, I'm very much into biomechanics and the rehab side of things, injury prevention. And I like. I'm very, very critical. Uh, so that's me. I do that sort of coaching. Yeah, same sort of thing. Like um, the thing I enjoy is probably programming people who want to do strength training, and want to do like powerlifting style stuff. Um, Again, though, the majority of the people I work with is more to do with weight loss, fat loss, that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're saying like hypertrophy based, strength based, it all, all carries over quite well. Um, and if you want those one to one sessions, Aaron does those. Yeah, I like going them, he doesn't. Nope. So, I yeah. do like workshop stuff for technique, but I don't do um, PT sessions. I'm not. I, yeah, I don't do one to ones to take you through a session. Up. <laughs> well, me. Um, yeah, to, to clarify, I'd say that I'm not a personal trainer, which people take offence to. Um, but effectively, just saying, I, I don't do the one-to-one -one sessions. So if you wanted to do a full session, so I'm take you through your program, do it all for you. Aaron kind of covers everything. He's a nice person than I am, so that's probably more his <laughs> his street than I. Than it is mine. Um, and if you want our apparel that neither of us are wearing, <laughs> but you thought you were. Wearing. I thought I'd got the right T-shirt. <laughs> Um, yeah, we offer t-shirts, hoodies, coaching, programming, nutrition. Uh, Aaron runs a class for conditioning based work if you're talking about that overall output per week and you want to eat more food. Yeah, there's um, normally a couple of spaces in that every yeah. week, so yeah. Uh, and then we're going to be offering more things, some more seminars that I've done in the past. Uh, there'll be workshops coming up if you want to do some of the te advanced technical, to, well, beginner moving up towards advanced. If you want to squat properly, deadlift yeah, properly, all that sort of stuff. We will be offering those sessions too. That's about everything. I feel like I've come across a bit grumpy, but I do feel a little bit full. He's grumpy all the time. Yeah. He was hangry when we started. Yeah. And I was happy for a little bit when I first had pizza. I'm and sad. now I'm sad again. <laughs> uh, I think that's about it. Bye. Thanks for watching any of it. I wouldn't. <laughs>